Jesus Christ, did you fine? Just hold it. Oh, it smells like shit. Spun is a little too wild for a traditional linear commentary. There's a little too much going on, so I'm going to break it down in a different way. Spun is a 2002 slice of life film directed by Jonas Ackerlund, who is most well known for his music videos, some which have been considered very controversial. He's directed music videos from everyone from Roxette, Metallica, Madonna, Lady Gaga, Ozzy Osbourne, The Rolling Stones, Britney Spears, Taylor Swift, Beyonce, and so many more. The film follows several meth addicts with interconnected lives over a three-day period. I've seen it described as a more comedic Requiem for a Dream, which came out two years earlier, and that's actually one of its biggest criticisms that it's too similar to Requiem for a Dream, and that it's lacking in anything new or unique. I, however, have not seen Requiem for a Dream, so this criticism is lost on me. The best comparison I can make is to other drug trip comedy dramas, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and Train Spotting, in the sense that the cinematography and editing are designed in such a way that you will feel like you are tripping with the characters. It really puts you in the headspace with the characters so that you are feeling a shadow of what they are going through. Additionally, the characters, while for the most part are far from being good people, they are all pretty likable, making for an utmost entertaining viewing experience. Ross is the main character. Played by Jason Schwartzman, he's this younger guy who probably had a somewhat normal life before his addiction, which seems to be a somewhat recent development. It's probably been going on for a few months at most, but he's already hooked, despite his claims otherwise. While all of the actors really nail the behavior of crank addicts, Jason Schwartzman's performance is really phenomenal. He's constantly fidgeting, being especially weird and maladjusted in public, he's pacing back and forth, constantly messing with his fingers, just looks extremely anxious and out of place all the time. At times he just seems like this normal kid who got caught up in the wrong crowd or got caught up with something bad, but he'll do things where you can see he's really messed up. He's absolutely delusional about what kind of person he is. He thinks he's a nice, normal guy, and he often projects that, makes sure other people know it. But as Brittany Murphy's character will say, nice, normal guys don't tie up and abandon girls in their apartments for days at a time. Yes, yeah, yeah, you heard that right. So, uh, Ross is casually hooking up with April, a professional dancer at the local club. You can guess what kind of club it is. But he's constantly telling other people that his actual girlfriend, the girl he really loves, is currently living in the city. And this is where he gets real delusional. His mission this entire movie is to talk to Amy. He's constantly talking about her and trying to call her and she never picks up. But he keeps trying because he's so caught up on her and their relationship. Which is now non-existent despite his beliefs otherwise. Obviously, in real life, he'd be absolutely awful, but it's something about the way Schwartzman plays the character and how he was written that there's just something that's just kind of likable about him. He says random shit like, You shave your balls. And it's out of left field. At one point, he's saying bye to the cook, and the cook never says bye back, and he just keeps uttering variations of goodbye, and he just never gets a response. Have a good night. Have a good one. Hi guys! It's kind of cute. It's kind of funny. Plus, much of the film is from his perspective, so we get into his mind more than any other character. Essentially, you could say we're almost tricked into liking him, because that's just the way the film is set up. For the most part, Ross is a passive character. He's driving around other people for a lot of the story, going wherever they ask, doing whatever they say. And that way he sort of does represent the audience, not having much to say, just being along for the ride. We see it through his eyes. This movie, the screenplay, was actually based on the writer's lives, particularly Will De Los Santos, who drove the cook around Eugene, Oregon for three days in 1995. So this probably stems from how it was written. But then Ross also just has all these other things, like the thing going on with April that makes him just seem as bad, if not worse, than the rest of the characters. But before we get into more of what's happening with April, we have to rewind a bit. Right off the bat, we're introduced to a bunch of characters through Ross. He's looking to score, but his dealer, Spider Mike, played by John Leguizamo, has lost the product. 
Spider Mike is in this constant state of panic and irritation. He's so tense and paranoid about everything. He freaks out every time there's a knock on the door or the phone rings, both which are happening constantly. And while Spider Mike is tearing the place apart, he insists Ross stay and wait until he finds his supply. He introduces Ross to Nikki, played by Brittany Murphy, and also at the house are Frisbee, another customer, played by Patrick Fujit, and Spider's girlfriend, Cookie, played by Mina Suvari. An interesting tidbit here, Mina Suvari had resin on her teeth to create the rotted teeth look. She ended up having to get her teeth professionally cleaned once filming wrapped to get the resin scraped off. Suvari said the look also included veins and eye bags drawn on, red eyeliner in the eyes, and a week of unwashed hair. And as you can probably tell, she is not the only one who underwent this treatment. Ross and Nikki hit it off. She's super cool, she seems like she has her shit together, at least compared to the rest of the people in the house who are all going nuts right now, and she keeps answering the phone, which is driving Spider insane. Via phone call, she tells her boyfriend, the cook, that Ross has a car. This is important because no one else in the story does. He's willing to quote unquote hire Ross to drive him and Nikki around town doing errands in exchange for Crank. Ross is broke and has an addiction he can't admit to, so of course he takes the job. The cook, played by Mickey Rourke, he's a character. I don't know what else to say about him. He's an intimidating figure. He works all day, watches wrestling on TV while he does it, and has a very specific taste in women, which he constantly makes very clear. But even despite all that, he's still in my top three synthesizers. Also, it's around this point that we get the opening credits, and they are so cool. Each character has their own logo, which is the coolest shit I've ever seen. According to an interview when director Jonas Ackerlund was asked about this, he said, Yes. But let's get back to April. So after leaving Spiders and dropping Nikki back off at the motel, Ross goes to see April at the club. He takes her back to his apartment after she gets off work and they have x -ay. But the next morning, Ross wakes up to a phone call from the cook, who calls him to come over immediately. April is... She's, she's tied up, assuming, assuming consensually, but when Ross tells her he's leaving, she's like, untie me? And he's like, nah, I'll do it later. Obviously, she starts panicking. Then he proceeds to duct tape not only her mouth, but her eyes too. Why? What's she gonna do? Stare at your ceiling? But yeah, needless to say, this is our first hint that Ross has serious issues, like, beyond the, like, ethme thing. Now, Ross has this really nosy neighbor, played by Debbie Harry of Blondie. She's been trying to eavesdrop because she could sense Ross was a freak from a mile off, and she's suspicious. But to make it harder to eavesdrop, Ross puts on some music for April, a hard rock CD turned all the way up and it skips. It goes... <laughs> Like, it was bad enough to keep her restrained against her will, but he went full-on torture mode. At one point, he comes back to the apartment and apologizes to April, and obviously she's pissed and freaking out. When he takes the tape off her mouth, she screams that she lost $200, which I assume means because she couldn't go to work, she lost out on getting money. It's understandable to be upset about, but um, there are bigger problems afoot. He never unties her, but she seems okay for a minute. They're making out, and then he leaves again. And of course, she gets she gets upset again. And uh, you know, there's duct tape, and there's a skipping the skipping CD. There's there's all of it. So responding to the cook's call, Ross arrives at the motel, which happens to be with the cook's lab. Nikki is freaking out. She says Taco, her dog, is dying, and they need to get him to the vet right away. Ross's main concern is the color. Would you look at Taco? That dog's green. <laughs> At the vet, Brittany Murphy gives such a good performance in this scene. I hyped up Jason Schwartzman already, but Brittany Murphy is also just really good here, the way she moves erratically, but she seems so oblivious on how others are perceiving her behavior. This scene makes for a good contrast, bringing the viewer back to reality. We see these people on rugs, but it becomes all the more obvious when we place them in a normal environment. When they're all together, it doesn't look as bad because they're contained in their own world, but as soon as they venture outside of their own world, we can compare them to the sober majority. We also see this with Ross a lot. As he follows the cook around, 
first to the truck stop to get ingredients, then to Circus Liquor, to the adult video store, and then to the Rip Stray Club. We see him tweaking out, pacing, picking at his nails, just radiating all this anxiety and paranoia. Oh, and this whole time, he's been trying to get a hold of Amy. He calls her at every opportunity, but she never answers. And each time he leaves a long message on her machine. He's also hallucinating much of the time, and the hallucinations while very jarring, are sometimes animated, which is very cool. Between the hyperfixated camera work, the alarming sounds, and the freaky imagery, it really allows you to get into the Bross's headspace, which is a very dark place, but I can't help but be astonished at how effective it is. So while all this is going on, Ross's adventures around town with the cook and Nikki, Frisbee, you know, who was hanging out at Spider's house earlier, well, he's at home with his mom right now. This B story is hilarious. In this universe, there's a TV show, much like Cops, called Bust, and two undercover cops from the show are staked outside Frisbee's trailer. They're looking for the cook and think this might be his hideout. These cops are such idiots. All the while, they're also snorting rugs. It's clear that they just think they're the shit. Which, to be fair, they look pretty cool. We've got one cop with a mullet, whose name is Mullet Cop, played by Peter Stormare, and we have one with a mustache, named Mustache Cop, played by Alexis Arquette. Arquette's cop wears these sunglasses with one lens significantly more tinted than the other. Like, why? I don't know, but it's iconic. So they're looking for the cook and somehow made their way to Frisbee's place. They look inside and see Frisbee's mom and say, she doesn't really match the description we were given. Then they proceed to break down the door anyway, waving their guns around and screaming at Frisbee and his mom. It's just, it's hilarious. I love a good cop parody, especially when the sole purpose is, look how dumb and sadistic these cops look. Back at the station, they try to convince Frisbee to work with them. They want to catch his dealer. Frisbee reluctantly agrees, or he's more forced to wear a wire, and he goes to Spider Mike's home but things go awry and he ends up getting shot in the balls. Back to our main characters. Nikki and the cook end up getting into a fight and Nikki decides she's leaving him, this time for good. Ross drives her around for a while and while both out of their minds, they have this overlapping conversation where Ross is whining about how much Amy loves him and Nikki is telling this really tragic backstory and it's really intense. We later receive another tragic story at the end of the film delivered to us none other than Mickey Rourke as the cook, and it's honestly the most emotional scene of the movie. It's a very humanizing story coming from this otherwise heartless and awful person. On the brighter side, the neighbor rescues April. There is circus slicker when the town's other dealer comes in. He's yelling at the girls at the counter, and Debbie Harry beats the shit out of him. She says she doesn't like to get violent, but men are evil and they deserve it. And the funny thing is that the exact same scene happened earlier in the movie, but it was the cook. He beat up the same guy who was doing the same shit in the same place to the same girls. Jonas Ackerland excellently finds a way to blend chaotic visuals with a really smooth, calm soundtrack done by Billy Corgan of the Smashing Pumpkins. We get all of these big name actors and musicians in both big and small roles. We have a brief appearance of Josh Peck as Fat Boy. Go away, Fat Boy! We see Eric Roberts, better known as Julia Roberts' brother, Charlotte Ayana as the sought-after Amy, and Judas Priest's Rob Halford. It's got all of this grungy, dirty, hard-to-watch realism to it, but also has moments of comedy and tragedy. It's something that can feel incredibly distant, yet very personal. Mina Savari said it best. I was touched by the film when I first saw it. I think it's poetic and really beautiful in a way. Nothing is glorified about these people in the drug, but they're normal people. You see all the sides of the characters. If you made it this far, make sure to subscribe to my channel, leave a like and a comment, but only if you want to. You don't have to, but I sincerely appreciate it if you do. And a personal thanks to my returning viewers, and I appreciate you all very much. For all others, this has been Editions of You, and thank you for watching. Bye!